Thanks all. Um, I did have a bit of a presentation going on and then I completely changed what I was going to talk about, so I, I don't have a fancy presentation. Um, I, I don't think what I'm talking about is terribly different. The, the conversation we've been having today and, and what we've heard is this is very much a national, natural progression of that. So I thought what I would um, start by talking about, um, I mean, the, the title of, of what I'm talking about is Collaborate to Innovate. And um, I think as the comment before said, you know, a lot of this is about integration, collaboration. It, it, there's no doubt that's the direction it's moving in and, and we're hearing that a lot. So um, just a, a bit of context in terms of what we do. Um, yes, we do work with wineries and we do wine PR, but a lot of what we do actually isn't wine. Um, we work with a lot of restaurants, a lot of chefs. We work with the likes of Matt Moran and Kylie Kwong and, and, and people like that. Um, we work with travel. We work with some property developers who are creating food precincts. So we, I, I like to think that... Um, we put a lens over PR and wine PR that is actually um, in the context of other industries and what similar industries and hospitality um, uh, industries are doing. Um, because we know the sector, we feel we know the influences um, and which consumers they have cut through to. Um, and increasingly, those influences, as we all know, are not just media. So our role is not just media relations, I guess. Um, most industries we work with now are collaborating right now. Um, it's everywhere. Our restaurateurs and chefs, they want to work with each other, they want to do special dinners, they want to curate forums together, big events, they want to talk about bigger issues. They don't just want to be in isolation, they don't want to be talked about just as themselves, as a chef and their little restaurant. They, they, want, a, they want bigger a bigger perspective. Um, I look at someone like Akali Kwong, she is constantly collaborating with um, local communities so that she brings a bigger story to what she's doing in her little restaurant. Um, you know, it, it creates a bigger piece. So we'll get onto that a bit, a bit more later. Um, you know, with prospective clients who come to us, they all want one thing, which is to reach people. They know that there are increasing channels to do that, and they want guidance as to how they're going to get to their potential customer. So everyone wants the same thing, um, it's just how they get there. Wine PR briefs are noticeably the most traditional and the safest briefs we receive. Um, I, I don't think there's any doubt in that in general. Um, they usually go something like this. We want wine writers to give us good reviews, um, we want people to know about our new vintage. We want people to know about the latest award. We, know, we want people to know that we got a high score from a certain wine writer um, or something international. But some brands are, are seeing that that's not what works anymore, um, if it ever did. Um, and now they ask us, how do I get out of the wine pages? How do I take wine to... to drinkers to people who actually just want to drink wine and enjoy it. Um, so, so sort of how do we move away from scores and awards and actually relate to drinkers, um, especially the ones who, who might otherwise be picking up cider, beer, whiskey, gin, any number of things, not just people who already love wine. How do we not preach to the converted? Um, and it's noisy, so, you know, a lot of brands are realising they're just shouting over each other, they're trying to tell the same stories. And um, if, if everyone's doing the same thing to the same people, um, to me that's the definition, really, of insanity. It's, it's kind of everybody's trying to say the same thing to a very small pool of people. So how do we, how do, we do something different? Um, you know, PR, as I've said before, is not just media publicity. Um, it's not talking to media just to flog a product or a person or a place. That will always play a part. Publicity is certainly what I do a lot of the time on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, it's not just talking to... We've, we've, this has already been raised, but it's not just talking to wine writers hoping that they will review a wine favourably. That's actually not our job and it has nothing to do with us. A PR doesn't influence anything to do with what a score is. I mean, basically, 
we may send a wine bottle out to um, a, a wine writer, but our job ends there, really. Either they like the wine or they don't. So it comes back to the product. So our job really is about the stories and how do the stories get out there and how do we encourage wineries to tell stories, not just look at scores. Um, you know, in saying that, we don't want to ignore those channels. They, they are very important. We've heard a good score absolutely sells a wine frequently, but that's not the job of PR. Um, that's the job of the wine and the product itself. Um, so if we want to see wine reach new heights of communication and reach new audiences and make its current audience, you know, completely convinced that not only wine is wine their drink of choice, but it's something that they're passionate about, we can't keep telling the same stories of winemakers and new vintages and awards and expect that we will get new results and that year on year, the brand will, will change its perception or, or increase its cut through. It just won't. Um, you know, PR is literally relating to the public, telling stories. We've heard that a lot today. It's all about the story. And, and we've heard that because it's, it's the truth of the matter. Um, you know, whether it's Tacey's audience at Broadsheet or, or whoever it is, in the end, people want stories, um, not just tasting notes. Um, PR is about earned media, not bought media. So, obviously, in the end, it's the, the job of PR to convince a media outlet or influencer that people should be interested in this or will be interested in this. And they'll see very quickly, we know now, we see online, they know whether their audience is interested or not. So, in the end, it's our job to adapt to that and see what consumers are wanting to read rather than, than preaching and telling them what they should be reading. Um, so I, I think what, what is an interesting trend at the moment as well is that increasingly we don't have to rely on media gatekeepers. Brands are now going direct to consumers. We're seeing that increasingly, I mean, in every industry, um, wine included. So it, it's, it's becoming about owned media, not just earned media. Think about how many brands are creating their contact, content and going direct to their consumer. So um, have a look on YouTube at... at Penfold's ample. Look at how they tell a brand story and they get 80,000 views telling the story exactly the way they want to tell it. Um, it's a trend. This is what we're seeing. Um, and it's, it doesn't just happen, obviously, in wine. I mean, it, it's happening more in other industries. LA Dodgers, for instance, um, as, a, as a big example, do not release any stories to media now. They go direct to their customers because they know that they're the most engaged and media then pick up those stories. They'll then tell media a greater story, but in terms of, of who owns the content, a lot of them are doing it direct. Um, and, and in a way, it is your responsibility to create interesting content that, that is going to grab the people that you're trying to appeal to. You can't just rely on other gatekeepers to do that for you. If you're not creating that content, then you know, you're the best person, really, to create it and then see how it can be seeded out there and, and who else can pick up on it. If it is good enough content, it will be picked up by, by other gatekeepers. So I think just looking at collaboration, given that's the, you know, that is the topic, collaboration basically is making a brand look better by association. Um, that could be, for wine, an association with a chef, it could be with a designer, it could be with an artist. We're not talking about it just being to other, an association and collaboration with other wine brands. Um, it could be working with a community, it could be working as a region, it could be demonstrating a shared history or the commonality of, of family ownership, which we've seen. Um, and the defining factor needs to be that it is mutually beneficial. There's no denying that a message is more powerful if it's told together. It, it, is, it is amplified and actually it's richer. So if, if one person's telling me that Riesling is the best varietal, I may not listen to them. If, if it's a huge group of people and it's a groundswell, I'm much more likely to pay attention, even if I don't agree with it. It doesn't matter. It's still, you know, as humans, we respond to power in numbers. Um, there are other joys of collaboration, you know. Um, generally, they give you more to say about your brand. You, you may be running out of stories to tell on your own. If you're a, if you're a, a brand that's been around for 30 years, 
How do you keep reinventing yourself and telling new stories? As a group or partnership, it opens a door to, to many new stories. Um, and also, they can dramatically increase your, your audience. If you are accessing another, another brand or person's fans or fan or customers, you're, you're automatically opening up a whole new window to people who may not have known you existed um, or may not have considered you in that light. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of examples very quickly. Um, they can also build your brand's equity. They can make your brand richer, more interesting. They can do two things. If you collaborate with the right person, brand, whatever it may be, they can make your brand more accessible or they can make it more aspirational. You know, you, you can get a different effect depending on who you've partnered with. And in the end, for wineries in particular, this is a huge thing, they are cost effective. If you band together, as we've seen many brands do, um, you actually could achieve much more uh, than you could ever dream of if you, if you tried to tackle it alone. So we've got some excellent examples at home, I think. Um, whether you believe personally they've been successful or not, I think what, what they have in common is that they have produced a lot of um, rich stories that can be told over years, months. You know, it, it's just um, creating, creating talk that can go on forever. So look at, for instance, Artisans of the Barossa, you know, group of small brands. How have they, what have they achieved by, by banding together? Look at Australia's first families of wine. They're pushed into markets outside of, of Australia. Could they have done a lot of what they've done alone? Probably not. And whether you believe essentially it's a good idea or a, um, or, or that it's been a huge success, what it has done undoubtedly is given all of them a lot more to talk about as a group. Um, even think of Mr. Sims events, Pino Palooza, Game of Rones, giving voices to, to smaller brands that, that can have something to say. Um, on a slightly grander scale, who does it best? Champagne does it incredibly well. Obviously, there's, there's budgets involved there, but you know, just this week, Louis Roderer and Philippe Stark have collaborated. It's simply to launch a 2006 vintage. There's not huge news there, but what Roderer have done by working with Philippe Stark is opening up, you know, he's one of the most, world's most famous designers and has a huge um, following of his own. They've opened that up, and by instantly sort of getting his endorsement, they've opened themselves up to a huge new, new base of people who may not have been particularly interested in Louis Roderer at all. Um, how about Verve Clicquot partnering with successful and inspirational businesswomen? What they've done by that is, giving them, is given themselves endless new content um, you know, for different audiences. It's, it's a broad club and they've been able to access it now and they've, they can access it for years to come and just continue to grow, grow that content. It also gives them a focus and a mission and, and I would argue a bit of clarity around what they're doing long term as a brand. Um, and, and in a way, what Champagne frequently does is try to add a bit of gravitas to a subject that, from a consumer perspective, may look a bit frivolous. Um, so it's interesting. I think we're seeing a lot of these collaborations. They're, they're very common in other industries, but, but I, I, think, I think we're starting to see them grow here. So I guess I'd just leave you with a question, which is um, a, lot, a lot of course has to be done individually, but if you were to open your mind and think about what a collaboration could do for you and who you might collaborate with, who would be your perfect dance partner? I mean, there, there are so many ways to skin that in wine. Um, you know, from very small collaborations with restaurants, creating your own wines, which many, many, many people do. Rockpool's been doing it for 25 years. There's, there's many examples. To grander, grander schemes, to banding together in, in any number of ways, whether it's regionally, community-wise, varietal-wise, who knows? But the, the options are limitless. And what I would say from a PR perspective is that it will open up a greater audience to you. That's it.